Hi, I'm Carol Lynn Holly with Idaho Business for Education, and I am here in the gorgeous conference room of Holland and Hart to welcome you to the Boise Valley Economic Partnership's third annual economic summit. Boise Valley Economic Partnership, locally known as BVAP, works to attract jobs to this region. By marketing the Boise Metro nationally and connecting these businesses with the resources they need to make the right decision, BVAP is ensuring the prosperity of our region and creating jobs for those of us who live here. By broadening our industry base, we're building a strong and diverse business community so that our region will better weather the inevitable next dip in the economy. Let's talk with a local supporter and stakeholder in BVEP, Michael Ballantyne of Thornton Oliver Keller. Michael, why do you choose BVEP? Thanks, Carolyn. We choose BVEP to ensure prosperity in this valley in good times and in bad. We want to create jobs for those people that live here, and we want to broaden our industry base. In 2018, BVEP attracted eight new companies to the valley, creating 2,000 jobs for area residents. In addition to expanding our tax base, these new employers give to our schools, our churches, our hospitals, and our local nonprofits. As a lifetime resident of the Valley, I want to create opportunities for my daughters and my grandchildren, for my neighbors and my friends. We need to continue to expand the industry base to create opportunities for all residents of our Valley. We're committed to BVEP's success and the success of this community. Thank you, Michael. BVEP couldn't do the great work that it does without local support from businesses like Thornton Oliver Keller and yours. BVEP is a nonprofit and it's supported by about 150 local businesses who believe in the mission of economic development and diversifying industry in our area. BVEP focuses in on four industries, technology, food processing, manufacturing, and back office support. We attract higher wage opportunities for our neighbors, clients, and our families. When there's more money in the hands of residents in this valley, we all do better. Hey, as the saying goes, a rising tide lifts all boats. So let's get to the meat of why we're all here at this summit. We're going to hear the latest on economic development, but we're also going to hear about philanthropy. When you connect those two together, you get a vibrant community. From each of these panels, we hope to hear what should we keep, what should we grow, and what should we change? Before we get to our first panel, we want to give a warm thank you to our presenting sponsors, Wells Fargo and Thornton Oliver Keller. Thank you for being here and supporting smart growth in our metro. Now, I get the chance to introduce the executive director of BVAP, Mr. Clark Krauss. You can all leave if you've heard me before. Um, and I've had about 13 shots of coffee, so I'm, I may be a little irate or something. But um, we wanted to first talk about, um, we're going to set the stage. And part of setting that stage is setting the stage about growth. It's all on our minds. You know, some of you have positive opinions about it and negative opinions. We think it's important to make sure that everybody understands exactly what's happening with growth in this valley today. So we're going we're gonna to do some slides here. And I just realized I'm, I'm responsible for slide moving, which, you know, for a 58-year-old guy, that's hard, even though it's got a green and a red button. Um, so we'll get started here. And of course, my green button's not working. All right. Uh, just a few things that we're going to just make sure that you understand about our valley. I know a lot of you know more than I do. But the population divide has moved a little bit. It used to be right at Eagle Road. We used to tell clients that were coming into this community that 50% of the population was on one side of Eagle and the other side was 50%. That's changed a little bit. It's moved more towards 10 Mile, just so you know. So when you think about inflow outflow, um, one of the interesting things when we look at infrastructure and things for the future, 80% of Meridian residents commute to work somewhere else. 74% of Nampa residents go to work somewhere else. And even in Boise, you know, our largest concentration, our biggest density, you got over 30% of the people moving by car from one part of the valley to the next. So just remember that as we're thinking about roads and infrastructure and things that we want to do in the future. Um, annual employment growth, you'll hear a lot of talk about 
oh my gosh, there's all kinds of people moving here, but there's no place for them to work. We actually are outpacing many of our, the, the nation, and we have Salt Lake up here for a special reason because we have a speaker here from uh, the Salt Lake area or from Utah that's gonna help us with this. But when you look at an annual employment growth, it's huge. We're almost at 4%. That's a really huge number when you think about the United States being at 1.5. So 21 years, we'll be at a million people. Now there may be other numbers out there or when are we gonna hit that, but we think it's about 21 years from now. The Boise MSA today is 730,000 people. And we're just gonna do kind of a comparison. If you put Salt Lake City Metro and the Provo Metro, you're looking at about almost two million people. And that doesn't include the Ogden Metropolitan, which would put them well over, I think, at 2.6. Yes? Okay. So metro area growth. I hope all of you can see this, but our growth is outpacing since 2011 to 2018. The country's 5%. The metros are about 6%. Salt Lake City's at 10.5%, and we're at 16.4. That sounds tremendous, right? I mean, when you think about growth and, and what that might mean, and just look at those numbers. I, I'm sorry. This is, this is population, sorry. So where are they coming from? Um, three years ago, 23% were coming from California. Last year it was around 33. This year it's California, it's 40%. Um, don't be too alarmed. I know a lot of you thought that would be 99% from California and 40, you know, not, not where it's at. Um, why isn't Oregon and Washington higher? It's because a lot of that, we do a lot of back and forth with Washington and Oregon. People don't tend to move back to California. Once they're here, you know they stay. Utah, 7%, Texas, 6%, Nevada, 5%. South Dakota, that's probably oil and gas, right? They, that, that's kind of over, and so people are moving back here for construction jobs and other things. And New Mexico, 3%, I, that's me. I moved from, so, well, no, it's, that's, that wouldn't just be me. That's got to be other people, too. And then Idaho, 12%. So that's Idaho rural and other areas moving into the Boise Metro. So I know you saw that 40% number and you're going, oh my gosh, you know, everybody's moving from California, but let's put this in context. Washington, the whole population of Washington is more than, is, is five times, is, is one fifth of what we have here. Or I mean, it's five times as many people as we have here, but it's at seven, 75 7.5 million. California is 40 million. So when you look at those numbers and who's moving in, we're getting people moving in from those other places, just there's more population in California. So of course we have more people moving from there. <clears throat> Out of state net migration. What does that net migration look like? What do those people look like? I know this is another one where you would have thought 65 and older would have been about 80%. I've heard that. I've heard that recently from some executives that said, I think that it's 80% people moving from California and 80% of them are over 65. Just not true. This is really good balanced growth coming in. And these are people that are highly educated, are coming in with some wealth. It's everything you'd want when you're looking at a future talent pipe. So Ada County growth, this is a really interesting number. You'll also hear this when you're in Albertson's grocery store, right, is we've never grown this fast before. When in fact in 1997, and then back in 1993, when we were a much smaller metro, we grew just the same. We, grew, we were growing uh, per capita, we were growing faster than we are today, but the numbers are very similar today. And it's about 2.6% growth today in 93 and, uh, 93 and 2000, 2003 and 97, we're at about 5% growth. So millennials aren't moving as much. They move one time. They move to your city because they want to be there, and they hunker down, and they've become part of our talent pool. 
So this is a great number. How many of you would have thought that for college retention rate, when our kids graduate out of, Boise, out of, out of a, a Boise Metro school, we're seventh in the country for them staying here after they graduate. Why is Houston on top? Because you can't get out of Houston. You just can't. There's roadblocks. Uh, their airplanes are shut down. If you're a college kid, you just can't get out. But look at the other company, Dallas, Seattle, Atlanta, Chicago, Miami, Charlotte, Louisville, all great cities, great health. I think, and I think one of our challenges should be, is we should be number one. I think every kid that came out of Boise State or U of I, if they could stay here, they probably would. We need more jobs, higher wage jobs, that can keep those kids here so that they can be part of why we all love living here. <clears throat> so that's, we're gonna set the stage with that. Now you don't have to listen to me anymore. Uh, we have two great um, people joining us. One is our facilitator. Uh, if you've been in the Valley for a while, hopefully you know Todd Cooper. Uh, he's been my former chairman two years in a row. And uh, he's a good friend of mine, but he's also a great mentor and someone who knows a lot about this environment and our economy. And uh, Todd, could you please come up? And can you give him a round? Uh, our other guest today, um, well, Todd, are you a guest? I'm a guest. I, I got, you're totally a guest. guest. Yeah. Um, I'm not getting paid, right? Our guest today, um, we just did a best practices. So I invited some of the communities across the country that I thought had the best economic development programs in the country. And we were lucky enough um, to have uh, New Orleans here yesterday. And that was a really interesting story about comeback. And also, Teresa Foxley, who runs the Economic Development Corporation of Utah. She's a CEO of that group, has been there for three years, and uh, is as intelligent as they come. And I'm glad she, she stayed long enough to be part of our panel today. So thank you. All right, where are you sitting? Right there. Let me here. Yeah. What we're going to do is we're going to spend about 20 minutes together, and we're going to weave the topics of growth, infrastructure and policy, and probably housing. And we're going to get Teresa's perspective and how these things impact the state she lives in and represents, and then also how they're impacting our valley today. Uh, before we start, it, it's interesting, I think, some in the audience would think we compete against Salt Lake City. Why have we invited the fox in the hen house here to hear all of our secrets? Uh, but it's really, it's really a regional effort, right, Teresa? And uh, Clark said it earlier today, if a company lands in Salt Lake City, they're going to come to Boise and vice versa. And really regionally, we compete against other regions in the country. And so, Teresa, earlier today you were talking about Salt Lake City, particularly in Boise, as second or third tier metros punching above their weights or uh, you know working operating with a chip on their shoulders when it comes to economic development so talk a little bit about that if you would and then also your impressions of, of the Boise Metro yeah well Todd thank you so much and Clark I, I really have appreciated the invitation to be here uh, it was a terrific exchange and maybe I'll start with the impressions question just because sure. I want to get it out of the way I love Boise uh, I love visiting Boise. I think it's such a cool town. I come up here every now and again for sporting events, and every time I come up, I think to myself, if I move, I'm moving to Boise. So I might be of one room. of those up there, 5%, I think, from Utah. <laughs> but it's just such a terrific community, beautiful city, gorgeous downtown, great state capital, love that the river flows through. You can tell you've had amazing family and philanthropic investment because the quality of this place is just so high. Great food scene, great uh, entertainment scene. It's just a, it's a terrific place and it's no wonder that people who go to school here want to stay here and it's no wonder that people from out of state want to, want to be a part of what you have going on here because it really is a very special place. And I think that's why your numbers are showing that you're, you're out punching where you should be, uh, you're outpacing the nation in terms of job growth and in terms of net migration and that really has created this flywheel effect in your economy. People want to live here, they want to stay here, there's a great quality of life. 
Uh, and so they're staying here, they're moving here, that attracts corporate attention and corporate investment. New job creation then attracts more people into your community. And uh, we're seeing, of course, a very similar phenomenon in, in Salt Lake City and other, uh, most other uh, significant Western metros are experiencing the same type of growth. So it's, it's a really prosperous time in the Intermountain West, in these two communities particularly, as well as some others closer to the coast. And Salt Lake City's had a, had a lot of headlines, a lot of big wins, right? Big names, Goldman and, and others move in. Uh, as, as you have had the success and growth and, and it's been consistent over time, uh, why is economic development so important today if you've had such a long track record of success? It's a great question and I want to make sure that Clark weighs in on this one too. Um, but we as a community will double our size primarily through organic growth in the next 30 years. So our population today stands at about 3.2 million. 80% of that resides along the Wasatch Front, so from about Ogden to, to Provo. So we've about just over 2.4 million, 2.5 million in that Wasatch Front area, and we expect to have 5 million residents. Again, a lot of net immigration now, but historically most of our growth, and we've been a fast-growing state for, uh, for a very long time, has been through organic growth or through replacement. And so it's so critical for us that we're thinking about how to create great job opportunities for the next generation of Utahns in an era that is so rapidly transforming technologically. And so, you know, we're seeing this massive potential displacement of workers through the fourth industrial revolution, through automation, AI, machine learning, 3D printing, uh, and so for us, it's this actually as important as it ever was to be thinking about how to position ourselves as a community for what we expect to be a pretty incredible disruption in the face of massive population growth. Clark? I, you know, I came here eight and a half years ago, and one of the things I led with, I still believe in, is uh, if you've ever seen Shawshank Redemption, best movie ever, best economic development movie ever, when, when they... <laughs> When he talks, when Andy Dufresne says to the other character, uh, get busy living or get busy dying, and I, I call it get busy growing or get busy dying, you can go to metros across the country. In fact, we were talking about what our best cities were yesterday uh, with a New Orleans guy, and somebody said Pittsburgh, and then we looked up Pittsburgh's numbers, and they didn't reflect. They have flat populations, so we, we discarded them as being part of the great cities today. I think you have to have growth. It, all you have to do is drive down the freeway and look at cities that are in decline. You don't want to live in them. And then you look at cities that are growing smartly, and that's where you want to be. We need to have jobs for our kids. We need jobs for our grandkids. You know, Michael said it on the video. We need jobs for our neighbors. We want to make sure that we ensure that for the futures that are coming behind us. And that means that we should start growing smart as we can. Thank you both. Teresa, you uh, coined a term we fell in love with uh, to describe some of the consistent growth, uh, prosperity fatigue. And this talks a little bit, is maybe going on in the valley here as well. Uh, talk a little bit about when you say prosperity fatigue, what do you mean by that and what's been the impact to your community? Yeah, it, we, we had a huge win that we were very proud of and we worked very hard on. It was a billion dollar uh, critical infrastructure investment by a major technology company. And one of our business publications said, Facebook is coming to Eagle Mountain, who cares? And I mean, that was like a gut punch to me because it was something that we put so much work into. They're laying $120 million worth of public infrastructure through uh, the public utilities. and. It just, that to me was this like notion of gosh, five, ten years ago, that would have been a huge marquee announcement in the state of Utah. And a business publication said, who cares? And I, I so we're, we've really started to pivot our messaging, of course, around um, public goods that are created, but also starting to acknowledge some of the externalities of growth, which in our case have, have meant uh, housing prices have crept up. 
in, in the state of Utah. Um, we've had a bit more congestion and because of our unique geography, when we have more congestion, particularly in the winter months, it means we have air quality issues. Uh, and it also, of course, impacts travel time, which has been, have been historically low and something we've competed on. Uh, unfortunately, um, I, I heard something the other day with respect to our growing homeless population, and that homelessness is no longer a symbol of decline, it's a product of prosperity because of gentrification and rising housing prices. And so when we talk about this prosperity fatigue, it's one, our media, our stakeholders are so used to us announcing month after month after month, X company moving in, creating X hundred jobs, that it's like whoop de doo And then also this feeling that this growth is really impacting me and the way that I live and my quality of life. And so we are really taking this as an opportunity to think about a new iteration, a new strategy of economic development that focuses on economic inclusion, uh, collaboration, which also tends to, to strain in times of prosperity and, and through growth. Uh, and again, sort of pivoting towards really doubling down on what we suspect to be the industries of the future where we know we have a competitive advantage. Um, but it, it's, it's something that we all have to do, I think, as economic development organizations in communities that are so attractive to both talent and corporate investment. Thank you. Clark, would you add? Yeah, I think one of the things that we were, you know, that keeps me up at night is we have, we, we've been blessed with, you know, at one time seven Fortune 500 companies and now that's four and there's been some globalization take place. And I, I really worry, you know, if one of those four takes a hit, where does that leave us? If we haven't created enough rooftops while the sun is shining as, as, you know, kind of one of those things that if we don't do it now, if we're not paying attention to creating jobs and opportunities now, and with, with, with the economy that is, is, is going to come down at some point, but also what happens if one of our great neighbors, you know, just has a tough year or a couple of years? I believe they'll all still be here, you know, in 50 years. I hope they are. But we need to diversify the types of jobs and opportunities that we have, not just for us, but for those kids and grandkids behind us. Thank you. It's interesting. Uh, Michael mentioned eight wins, 2,000 jobs. I don't remember a headline around any of those big wins. Uh, we think of those jobs as new opportunities for existing employees. Rarely do we get a, a company bring 100 jobs to the Valley and they bring 100 people with them, right? So. Uh, it's new opportunities here. So I think prosperity fatigue, if we had an uh, article from the paper, you know, our, our big anti-growth thing was CVS Pharmacy, right? You could hold the picture of this no CVS signs right alongside the no Amazon signs when they kicked Amazon out of New York City. Uh, the sentiment's similar, right? And uh, so it's interesting, the prosperity fatigue, we, we like that comment. Tell us, uh, let's go a, a little different direction for a minute. Uh, Teresa, your organization is statewide, and so you deal with policy issues that maybe pit metro against rural. And we're Boise Valley Economic Partnership, so a lot of ours are, are uh, metro issues, but talk about that balance for you, if you wouldn't mind, uh, in your role, and, and how's your state approaching the the differences and the different needs and, and di needs for different tools, metro versus rural. Yeah, so Todd, I, I mentioned that 80% of our population resides along the Wasatch Front, and the remaining 20% is, and so that's a very dense population. In fact, it puts us at, I think, the eighth most urbanized state in the country, which people are usually really surprised to hear because we're a big, square, western state. And so that means that 20% of the population resides in pretty small rural communities. And the economic outlook uh, on the Wasatch Front is much different than the economic outlook in many of our rural communities. We've seen you know, declining population in, in some of those rural communities, but we have a few, uh, a few really bright spots or green shoots in some of our rural communities, and those include tourism. Uh, this is a big generational shift that we're seeing with millennials and Gen Z wanting to spend more of their income on experiences than on things. And so you see this in national parks across the country. Visitorship is up. 
Um, and, and so we know that there's a place for our rural communities to play in this, in this tourism industry. And I think that's probably very true here in Idaho where you have some of the most beautiful land. Um, we have great broadband throughout our rural communities, and so a lot of, uh, we, we focus pretty heavily on training export-based businesses in rural communities so that they can sell to a global marketplace. Uh, and then we're creating what we call mega sites, so there's a concept in economic development around certified sites that are sort of ready to go for big investments, and if there's anything that rural Utah has, it's a lot of land and the opportunity maybe for uh, not a large employment center, but a big critical infrastructure type project that's going to create a lot of capital investment in a, in a community. And so we really, that's a big part of our rural economic development strategy is around, again, economic gardening, understanding the assets that exist there from a, uh, from a tourism standpoint, and then trying to trying to create better sales opportunities for existing rural businesses. It's not a huge recruitment. Play, but gotcha. but the the mega sites would be a piece of a recruitment play. And, and Clark Biba, we have rural communities in the Boise Valley, right, that sit at our table. Uh, how do we make sure their voices are heard and part of this conversation? Yeah, I think one of the things that um, we've learned to do is we, we we get on the phone and communicate with each other, and I think it's just taking that communication to the next level. Of um, I, th I think all of us could do a better job of of saying. Why is this also good for Blackfoot, right? Why is this also good for Idaho Falls? And that's something I think that Utah did really well. I was down in Utah when the Olympics came and I was in a little town, Cedar City, which is a long ways away from Salt Lake. In fact, it's closer to Las Vegas. But they did a great job of doing something hard and communicating, we're gonna do this together. And I, I think that's really important. And, and I think that's one, one of the reasons I was really happy to have Teresa come up here and talk about this. Thanks. Uh, okay, let's, Clark, let's try to put some numbers around the growth piece. So if you recruit 100 jobs with 5 to $10 million of new investment in the community, how does that impact our population? Talk to us about the numbers behind that. Yeah, I you know, I, what, what, one thing I would tell all of you, and I, I kind of forgot about this. I, I guess I've been doing it for a while, and so I forget that people don't understand that, like, when we bring 100 jobs into this valley, and we're, we're going for those jobs that pay more than Canyon County or Ada County have paid, right? This is, so when we bring those 100 jobs in, I started getting these conversations in, at the Albertsons grocery store of, well, that's 100 more families coming into the area. Well, the reality is, is when Paylocity came here with their 550 jobs, which is now going to be 700 and much more higher wage because they've had so much success here, they're hiring all local. So it's, it's, it's taking those jobs that they have today and, and they get a better job. And that's the kind of thing that we're doing when it comes to economic development. It's also there's a huge impact of, if you, if you bring in one manufacturing job, it tends to create almost two to three other jobs uh, for service providers and other people that are gonna serve them. So it has a huge generator and obviously taxes, uh, we, need, we need infrastructure here, we need some corporate people to pay part of that and it'd be nice to have some more partners that are part of our tax rolls. Thank you, Clark. Anything around that topic, Teresa? No, you know, we have a similar messaging challenge, which is most of the uh, new projects that we announce are coming to Utah to access an incumbent labor pool. In, in very few instances are they relocating a lot of individuals from wherever they are. They tend to be expansion projects. And so I would just share that we could probably all improve our messaging around what a new project means. Um, sure, people might move in on a macro sense into your metro because they see a growing economy and, and great lifestyle arbitrage that can, can happen here, here in Boise or uh, along the Wasatch Front or elsewhere in Utah, but it, it really is so much these corporations want to be here because they want to be part of your community. They want to access what you have to offer. Thank you. It, it's about talent at the end of the day. And uh, you know, we talked about this earlier today, the three of us got together, and uh, you know, companies are looking for the talent, and talent are gonna follow the companies. So it's kind of this virtuous cycle where it keeps going and keeps going. And Utah, I think, has done a phenomenal job, Teresa, with their educational system, 
pre-K through post-secondary. Talk a little bit about the impact of the Utah educational system and maybe the culture around that to your role in economic development. Yeah, I think you're, sp you're spot on, Todd. It's a big part of our culture and community, uh, seeking higher education. Um, and really, I think people, again, are, are sort of surprised. We tend, to, we tend to not spend a lot of money. You know, we have a low per pupil spend, but we have really good outcomes, and that has to do a lot with parental involvement, and uh, it's just sort of the ethos of the state, too. We try and do things in a really, you know, fiscally responsible way. Um, but we have over 200,000 students enrolled in our system of higher education today. And again, because of our unique geography, which is everyone's sort of crammed into this 80-mile corridor, uh, most of that student population is along the Wasatch Front. So you have Brigham Young, Utah Valley University, University of Utah, Weber State University, and they are graduating about 40,000 students every single year who are then looking for jobs. And, and I was kind of bummed not to see Utah on your sticky slide up there for, uh, re for retention of graduates. Because again, people like living in Utah. It's, it's, it's affordable, it's a great place to raise a family, great career options. And so you have 40,000 40, graduates, most of whom I believe would like to stay in the state of Utah. And so again, that's a big part of what we do is to try and create opportunities on the demand side for them to have some place to stay. Terrific. We're envious of your 40,000 grads. Clark, when you have a project in town, how many employers talk to you about talent pipeline? How many, how many employees are available today? What's the workforce availability today? And what does it look like five years, 10 years from now? Yeah, the, the big shift has been, uh, in particular, the last five years. And we used to talk about electric rates. And they're still important, but they've already figured out what your electric rates are. Um, they'll talk about how much they're going to pay to lease or bill, but they already know that. I mean, data today that has driven them to your market, so they've already answered those questions. The question they can't answer in Chicago before they come fly in here to answer it is, what does your talent pool look like, and where are we going to get them? And so we talk to Boise State and CWI and U of I and NNU and all of our great universities all the time because we have to prove out, I think, 80% of our conversation anymore is about talent. Where am I going to get it today? Where am I going to get it 5, 10, 15 years out? We have used this in-migration that we showed you earlier. That is, that's, that's the secret sauce for us. That and ease of, of, of access to recreation and quality of life. But that all is about having the talent here today, but also them seeing it coming in tomorrow. Terrific. We have two minutes left. That went fast, didn't it? That did go fast. Uh, Teresa, we want to ask you if you wanted to summarize a few key thoughts here at this point. Well, again, I would thank you all for the invitation to be here. It really has been terrific. I th I, I'm always astonished when I visit another community at how, much, how many similarities we have. And I think that's especially true between our market, which is the entire state, and, and Boise. We really, as a community, have the tiger by the tail, as do you. And so much of that is because you have had great philanthropic leadership over the years and great corporate partners that have invested in this place. And I think if you continue to, to hold on to that and really cleave to that as a community, the future Clark, the, the Clark 50 years from now, who's up on this stage, will, will continue to have the tiger by the tail. I There's hope they don't get another one of those. <laughs> <laughs> Who says it won't be him? <laughs> um, that, I, I mean, it, it really is, a, it is an amazing place, and you've got to hang on to what makes this place great, though, which is your, your, your availability to access the outdoors, the sense of community here. Um, embracing what it is that makes Boise unique, which is your, your, your forest and your river and your downtown. It's just incredible. It's an incredible place. Yeah, thank you. Clark, uh, you started by clarifying some of the growth story for us. I appreciate that. And there have been some, you know, we've all seen the yard signs, right? We're full, Californians go home, whatever the case may be. Um, it, it's interesting to me how they say that, people that take that 
stance because they love what this is, city and community is about. And it's not about acting or behaving like that. And so the... <laughs> thank you, all five of you. The, uh, the, uh, the golden goose is being choked by those that are here uh, because Boise Nice is a thing and it's meaningful and that's part of the reason we all choose to live here. So Clark, I've kind of set this on a tee for you or maybe I've knocked it in the rough, I'm not sure which, but talk about growth and where we go from here and some closing comments around this topic, if you would. Well, I, you know, I, I know we're, we're sitting, we, we could all, we we're probably all in the same line and, and we all see the, the benefits of growth and that's why you're here today. But I would tell you, we, we need your help. You know, we need, we need your help when it comes to correcting some of these attitudes that are out there. And what I mean by that is what they're most afraid of is what they're gonna change. If you start California shaming or whatever, whoever else you got a beef with, and you give yourself that liberty of going after a certain, I don't care, certain race, a certain people, you, you, you risk changing this place more than the people that are coming in here. I truly believe that you, you're here for a reason. Let's keep that reason for everybody who comes in here, but for ourselves as well. If we start to isolate and we start to, you know, slice off everybody but, we're going to have some real problems. This place is going to change in a way you don't want to see it. That's what I have for you. Thank you. Uh, please join me in thanking, especially Teresa for taking her time in part. Wow. That was really good. Isn't it amazing to hear the impact that business can have on the vibrancy of a metro? You know, thinking of our companies around here, I want to tell you about one of them out of Nampa, Horsewood. You're going to get a chance to uh, taste some of their food after this summit. But I want you to know that this place is incredible. It, their food is locally sourced and it's regionally inspired. Food is love. At the root and the heart of it is love. You cook for your children because you love them. And that's what we try to really give to people is that love. And if we love people, then we're going to go try to give them food that's going to nourish them, not hurt them, but take care of them. So yeah, my name is Aaron Horsewood. Um, I own and operate Horsewood Catering along with my wife, my children, my sister. We're family ran. Um, it's just, uh, it's a generational thing, something we were brought up in, taught. Um, about 10 years ago, my sister and I and my wife got together, started talking about how do we create a system that can feed a lot of people, yet help out a lot of farms. And so we started this program uh, with local farmers, building the relationship first, showing them that we were sincere and that we were in it for the long haul, not just dipping in and, and, and taking off on them, but that we were really going to do this. The state is beautiful. You know what I mean? We've got so much at our hands here. We've got these beautiful, gorgeous mountains right here, a river that runs through a valley. I mean, it lends itself to everything we need. It's an ecosystem. It's creating that education, that ecosystem. And that's essentially what we need to do, I think, as, as a society. When a client calls us, we set up a meeting. I don't care, big or small, we specifically write a menu for that client. We're gonna ask you your story, and we're gonna tell a story through food. Where did your wife and you meet at? What was your first date? What did you eat on your first date? Where did you fall in love at? What's your favorite music? Weird questions, but it all ties in. I play your music the day of your event in this kitchen because I want you to remember you're never gonna be a number to me. You'll be a person the whole way through this. And with that story, we're also gonna help other people's stories out. The farmers, the ranchers, we're gonna help their story. We're going to grow for you, and we're going to go out and pick those vegetables. We're going to make sure, no matter what, that that's protected, and that you're safe, and your guest is safe. Authentic is when, at your heart, right, your heart, your soul, is actually intertwined with it. That's when it becomes authentic. Now don't forget, right after this event, join us in the Grove so you can taste some of that delicious food. I want to tell you about the sponsors for tonight's reception. And here they are, Title I Corporation, 
Idaho Central Credit Union, Intermountain Gas Company, Givens Pursley, and Albertsons. We know that business has a huge impact on the well-being of our community, but what about philanthropy? Well, we get the opportunity today to hear from a woman who has invested a lifetime into the legacy of her family in this valley. Over the course of Jamie's career, she's been a leader in local and statewide philanthropy in Idaho. She has served in nearly every role with the J.A. and Katherine Alberson Foundation, as well as a board member of the Bogus Basin Recreational Association, the Bishop Kelly Foundation, the Boise Art Museum, and the Special Olympics World Winter Games. So we want to welcome to the stage now, Jamie Jo Scott and Roger Quarles, the executive director of the J.A. and Katherine Albertson Foundation. Take it away. Hi. Thank you, Carolyn. That was really odd because, yeah, you're right there. Yeah, hey. <laughs> Very nice introduction. Thank you. Hi, Raj. Hi, Jamie. Long Dr. time no see. Dr. Quarles. How are you doing today? Great. Um, can I just start by you can do whatever you want. interrupting you like I do all day long, every day? Um, so I want to thank Clark for getting me out of my comfort zone. Um, you may have slightly downplayed this event when you accosted me in the parking lot a year ago <laughs> and said something like, hey, do you think you would ever come and talk to BVEP? Um, so thank you for this amazing opportunity. I feel like I'm in front of a lot of people that I generally just have so much admiration for. And to talk in front of people that you greatly respect and admire makes it all the more nerve wracking. So thank you, Clark. I really appreciate it. <laughs> You ready? Ready. Are you sure? No. OK. So where were you born? Right here in Boise, St. Luke's Hospital. Yeah? What year? I'm kidding. No. Um, where did you go to school? Where did you go to elementary school? I went to Highlands Elementary, seven years, North Junior High after, and Bishop Kelly. OK. And then did you go on to college after that? I actually went to University of Utah. Um, and did not stay, did a stint in Austin, Texas at St. Edwards University and finished proudly at College of Idaho. That's super cool. So what was your, like elementary, what was your school experience here in the Treasure Valley? What was that like for you? Do you remember anything? <laughs> it's a long, I mean, it was a couple years ago. It's so. been a while, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah it, was, it was great. I mean, I think like a lot of um, my contemporaries, we feel very nostalgic and fond of of the educational experience we had, particularly if you went to school in Idaho. Um, you had many of the same, well, I had many of the same teachers that my parents had, and uh, it was very familiar, it was very safe. Um, so it was a, a happy experience. Okay. I know how much you love your family, and especially your boys, and I'm curious as to how they influence your daily routine. Well, I had a chance to think about that a little bit, so I went ahead and asked an expert, and um, I brought a video along to play for you. Talk from your perspective. Okay, so the question is, how does your family influence your daily routine? I'm talking from your perspective. Future okay. mom. Future mom. <laughs> um, I'd say raising boys makes me a little more grateful for what I do and the work I put into and having more appreciation for moms who have more kids and girls, which would probably be harder to raise. I don't know, I've never raised a girl, but <laughs> for all the moms out there who have to work with that, I'm sure it's hard at sometimes and you love it sometimes, mm -hmm. which is how it can be with boys. Mm -hmm. They can be a hassle and get on your nerves but at the end of the day, it's worth it somehow in one, some way, and it makes you appreciate why you work for them and why you raise them, and seeing them go off and do amazing things, <clears throat> seeing them go off and do amazing things and grow up and go through their life and eventually become someone who's a contributor to the world. Yeah. 
How do you influence my daily routine, do you think? Um, probably changing how you think of your day from the way how you'd normally wake up and what you do in the morning. What do I do in the morning? Breakfast, wake us up, get us ready, take us to school, drop us off, pick us up, make sure we have lunches. Mom life, eh? Hey? Mm-hmm. And then work. And then straight off to work. <laughs> oh, that's so good. Hilarious exercise. Maybe you've all done it, but to ask your kids what you think you do, what they think you do all, all day, or what your job is, um, is, is pretty funny. So uh, he says it best, I think. He's a really smart young man. He's a cutie. For, is he 11? 11 years old. For an 11 year old young man, he's yeah. very, very smart. Yeah. Okay. So when you think of Idaho, what, what's the first thing that comes to mind for you? I think just the beauty. You know, I, the first speakers really touched on, I'm a fifth generation Idaho and I grew up largely outside, um, fishing, camping. Um, I, I think there's no more, no more beautiful place, but the people make it beautiful as well. I think we did, uh, Todd stole my Boise nice. We, invited a colleague here to do some work and he ended up writing a blog, there's nice and there's Boise nice. Just um, a hard working pioneering spirit, people that are generally connected and care, makes it the only place I wanna live. Okay. What's the coolest gift anyone has ever given you? Well, I didn't see it as a gift at the time. I think I, <laughs> saw, I saw it as an obligation, but my, my family presented me the opportunity to be executive director of our family foundation, which is a, a, a pretty big job, wouldn't you say, Roger? Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's a really big job. And I had never um, had an experience in such a professional capacity before. I had been on um, some boards and had worked in a very different capacity and I truly didn't see myself in that role. Um, but they were really encouraging and supportive and it ended up just totally changing the trajectory of my life. It allowed me to be involved in big, you know, complex issues. We work a lot in education. Um, I learned a lot about systems and um, bureaucracies. Uh, I learned a lot about the joy of being able to work with other leaders, um, being part of a team. Um, and so it's ended up being a tremendous gift of opportunity for me. I love it. So our theme today is, you know, like we're talking about what does it mean to be a community leader and especially as a philanthropist and a, and a native Idahoan. And so I'd like to move into just a, a little bit of your professional life. And you just touched on the greatest gift was becoming the executive director and now the president and chair of our board. Let's talk a little bit about your first job. What was your first job? I worked in a daycare uh, in McCall. Then I moved up to become a, a waitress in a cafe. Uh, and then I worked in Salt Lake City for the US ski team and ultimately at the 2002 Winter Games in event production. What did you like about those jobs? Or what, yeah, what did you like and what really wasn't your favorite thing? Well, I think everyone should wait a table or two. Um, working at the daycare taught me a little bit about being on time and responsibility and patience. In fact, my favorite kids were Barbara and Clay Morgan's boys. Um, and that was just really fun to get to know their family. Um, US ski team was fast paced and it was about being part of a team and that really is where I learned just the, I think the, the, the fun and the challenge of being part of something bigger and working towards a collective goal. So where do, you, where do you think, if you don't know Jamie personally, she's probably one of the hardest working people I've ever known. So I'm curious as to where you think, where you got your work ethic. I think through um, my family and, and my friends. Obviously, coming from an entrepreneurial, uh, spirited family, really admire my grandparents, my great-grandparents, and that tone was just set from, from the get-go. My dad still works every day, and even though we keep trying to get him to retire, but it, um, that, that didn't happen. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So now let's move on to some bigger questions. 
What would you say are the driving influences in successful companies and organizations? Yeah, I, I, I thought a lot about this. Um, I'm the first family member to have been executive director of our organization. I might be the last. I'm also the last generation that really knew my grandparents, the founding members of our foundation. So for me, something that was a really important process during my time as executive director was to think about what it was that made our organization what it is. So what were the instilling values? How do we set the culture that would go on? Um, the other thing that a lot of people don't know is Joe and Catherine never set a mandate for giving. They never said you have to keep the money in Idaho. They never said you can only give to education. We have worked as a board and as a family to choose areas that we think would have the greatest impact. And so the work could change with generational interests, but I wanted the value system to be instilled, and that's what I worked hard to do. And we went through months of exercise trying to figure out what was right and came up with you know, not surprising themes like integrity and results and family engagement. And I felt really good about them. So we were going through a little reno at our office. So I proudly put them up on the wall. And then literally the next week, I was at a conference in San Francisco and Reed Hastings, the Netflix CEO, was speaking. And he was talking about company culture and how important it was as a leader to instill the culture. And he said, and the stupidest thing that you can do is put them up on your wall. <laughs> and I was just. We so, took them down. I was, I'm kidding. I was a little devastated. But what I think what he was trying to get to was the authenticity of those words. And there are a lot of, I think, exercises that have to do with company values and um, you know, mission statements. But the trick is, how do you authentically walk that walk? And you know, you can, I think, vouch for the fact that when we're doing different initiatives or programs, um, we spend a lot of time talking about whether or not we're truly acting on behalf of our value system. And I think you have to revisit that to the point of you know, almost exhaustion if you really want to instill them and to make them stick after you're gone. So you, you mentioned leadership is one of our values. I, I'm curious what good leadership looks like to you. Well, what does that feel like? Yeah, what, I mean, I mean, is I'll, it evident? I'll tell, I'll tell you all about leadership that I really admire right now, and it has to do with people that are not afraid to solve complex uh, problems. And as we hear about all this growth that's happening in our region, I think we are going to experience the onset of more and more complex problems, something that we have been somewhat sheltered from as a small, you know, fairly both uh, geographically and um, diversely isolated. We've been able to dodge some pretty complex problems that are now coming our way. Um, we talked a little bit about homelessness earlier, something that's been on my radar as a philanthropist. Uh, I think it's an extremely complex problem. I haven't, I haven't felt like I have a good sense of what really adequate, um, innovative, sympathetic, empathetic solutions are. But you look at someone like Jody Peterson that from the Interfaith Sanctuary who has taken a view of, of a very complex problem, works on it every day, um, I think has made some tremendous strides. Uh, if you speak with her, you feel like this is, a, this is something that we can collectively solve and, it, and we can overcome it. And that is a tremendous sign of a leader to me. Um, she humanized homelessness for me as well. She told me a story where she had worked personally for 18 months to get a homeless gentleman an identification card, a birth certificate. As the story came up, I knew who she was talking about. It was someone that I had walked past daily in my neighborhood, actually in front of my son's school. Um, and I bought him a few cups of coffee, but other than that, I didn't really, I couldn't get a sense of how to, to help. Um, once Jody told me that she had been successful in placing Philip in uh, Housing First, my son, who you saw earlier, and I went grocery shopping for Philip, went to his apartment, he came down to the lobby, the difference in the person that I'd seen for years suffering 
uh, on the street versus the pride, his, um, you know, his energy, his, his health, his complexion of, of being, his pride of being an apartment owner um, and, you know, even criticize the groceries that we brought, didn't, <laughs> didn't have the right things. And um, it just, it was just um, such a learning experience. And Jody, to me, embodies that leadership. Um, I just want to talk about one more, one more leader right now, and um, Ryan Peck, who is one of the founders of Boise Rock School. My kids have benefited tremendously from that. Rock School is such a great program, not only because it's just adorable to watch a five-year-old play Black Sabbath on the guitar, but it's been <laughs> like a very, um, you know, introducing a, a replacement, I think, for some of the loss of, of, of cultural and art programs that our kids are, have experienced. But um, he talks a lot about economic development through cultural hubs. And again, this is you know, something that I, I'm learning about. But um, when you talk about recruiting and growing talent, you need to remember that we have a lot of talent here in our valley and in our state, and it's in our youth. But they really only know the proximity of the opportunities that they see. And if it's just culture through bars and nightlife and through, you know, maybe opportunities that feel a bit um, older to them, um, I don't think that they see themselves as being able to live in Boise as a future creative entrepreneurial spirit or as a musician or as an artist. And Ryan does an amazing job connecting the dots between the opportunity of, for building cultural hubs and opportunities for our youth and what that means for economic development. So I think um, leadership looks like taking a complex problem and just starting to chip away at it. So this might lead into this next question too, is what's the best advice anyone's ever given you? Well, in, in, our, in our foundation, um, so well, I guess on the leadership vein, um, there's a quote that makes me smile a little bit, which is, if you, if you want to be liked to sell ice cream, don't be a leader. And I think it, to tag on to that, um, if you want to be hated, challenge public education. And that is the space that our, our family foundation has, has chose to work in. Um, and I was lamenting at one of our board meetings that we were getting very criticized for having an ulterior motive or hidden agendas. And um, you know, when you work in, in these kind of arenas, that's, that's common. And I was feeling sorry for myself. And Gary Michael, who's been on our board for a long time, said, well, of course, uh, of course you're going to make people mad. You're doing stuff. He basically said, you know, if you don't want to piss anybody off, then don't do anything. And so I try to remember that sometimes when you know, there's, there's critiques or things are not feeling great, which is, um, I think you just keep trying to, to do something. That's good. So you talked about how much you love Idaho, uh, fifth generation. Given the current state of affairs, how would you expand on the three questions that Clark posed earlier, or maybe it was Carolyn? What would you grow, what would you keep, and what would you change? So we'll just go with, what would you grow first? Um, Besides hops. Yeah, yeah, we can talk about that later. But. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I think the, the what would I grow is um, deploying, starting to deploy resources differently. Um, what I mean by that is, um, especially with, with so much growth, for instance, uh, we were able to participate in the new Meridian YMCA, the Y on the Hill. If you don't know about that YMCA, it's not just a YMCA, it's also an elementary school. There's a community library. There's a St. Luke's health office. Um, there's a city park. And um, I'm really interested in thinking about as smart growth as, and so many entities that need facilities. Um, and this collaborative um, approach to taking you know, services and nonprofits and having them collaborate together. Um, to put those groups together in one building and get them to sign an MOU is no small feat, but there was a willingness by all of those entities 
that it would be better for the community. And I, I think it's proven to be right. Um, the Ada County Boys and Girls Club had a charter school be built in their backyard. And instead of the charter school building a gym and a cafeteria and a playground, they collaborate on the same space, which for the kids is incredible. Many of them are there from seven in the morning until six at night. And you know, the, the partnership is, is seamless between those two organizations. And I think that's really innovative. And I think seeing more of that would be good. OK, anything else you want to grow right now? Or you want me to go to yeah. keep? What would you like to keep? Well, to Clark's point, I think we have to figure out how to keep our our value system, our our pioneering spirit, our um, fiscal conservancy. I think these are things that have made our state great, um, and I think we have to. It'll be a challenge as we face bigger issues and have an influx of more people to to do that. Okay, what would you change? Um, well, I think this is changing, um, and it would just be a broader group of representation. I think for many years, a very small group of people made decisions for a large group of people. And um, I think this is starting to change through including a bigger representation of, of community into some big, um, into some big decision making, um, you know, whether that's on boards or as elected officials or um, that, that I think will serve us well to do that. Um, is that harder? Is that harder to do? Is it slower? Yeah, I think what I'd like to do is take a moment maybe to talk about the pitfalls of, of some of the things that, that you just asked me. Um, so we talk about ease, convenience, nice, it's very convenient to live here. It's easy to live here. If you've been in a big city, you come home, walking through the airport, you're just like so relieved. And you can park your car in the front row or the bottom tier of the parking garage. I and mean, all these things that I think we really, really enjoy. But when life is easy and convenient, which um, we all benefit from, I think it, there's a danger of becoming apathetic. And through our work in, in you know, thinking about the future of education, we see some really scary data coming down the pipe. I mean, there was a Bloomberg report that was released just yesterday. Uh, there's no shortage of, of information coming at us that says that we need to be taking some of these issues seriously and we need to start working on them collectively now. And there's a, a feeling, I think, of, of apathy um, because it is a nice life here that we have to be I think pretty conscious of um, and, and careful about. <laughs> Same goes with you know this Boise bubble, and I live in it myself and I appreciate it. But we work statewide as a foundation, um, and over 50% of our kids in school are in poverty. We have the lowest go-on rate in the state. If you think the economic health of communities that are 40 miles away are not going to impact Boise Valley economic development. I think it's short-sighted, and we have to you know, be honest about the health of our next generation, the health of, of communities, if we want to really grow um, together. Um, and then uh, the last thing is um, we talk you know, about this idea of limited government, and I am a fan until it starts to hinder you know, visionary leadership. Um, there's um, a lot of focus on collaboration, and I think building consensus is imperative. But I'm tired of serving on task force and um, uh, that, that don't end up in action. And in order to get there, I think you have to have a vision and some courageous leadership that sort of transcends this notion of limited government and career public office and I um, you know I hope that we can get there. I think they agree. <laughs> so how do you stay true to your values as a philanthropist? We try I mean continuous improvement is really important to us as a family. I know my team is here and a lot of people come to work at the foundation because they think giving money away is fun, and it is. 
Um, but we do spend a lot of time uh, digging deeper into where we failed, how we can get better. Um, and so, you know, for me, it's about celebrating your wins, but then also saying, well, what could have gone better and what, what should we be doing better and just um, being honest. Uh, it's also about knowing who you serve, um, knowing the communities you work in. One of our initiatives has allowed us to talk with, gosh, Roger, you 15,000 teenagers in the past year? Is that about right? The best three, three and a half, four years. Okay. So in, in Buck the Quo. Buck the Quo, yeah. our initiative um, has allowed us to have pretty direct one-on-one -on -one conversations with, with teens. And, um, you know, like we've touched on, there's a sense, uh, we know through Gallup Education, one of the, the data sources that we appreciate, that hope and engagement is the number one predictor for student success. It transcends test scores, it transcends economic, um, where you're coming from economically. Uh, and I, I can tell you in our conversations that there is a, a lack of hope and engagement with our youth right now. Um, and that's, it's concerning. So to be able to show them opportunities in Idaho that really connect with them is something we all have to do. Um, and knowing that uh, we try to represent a student voice and student experience in some of the initiatives that we do, it keeps you pretty honest. I've heard you talk about, I maybe hope you could elaborate on kind of just philosophical beliefs of, of our foundation and how we approach things as being believers in free markets, et cetera. Yeah, I, I like the idea of entrepreneurial spirit. I think philanthropy plays a pretty unique role, um, especially private foundation. Often wealth, wealthy people are, are criticized for wielding too much power and influence, and I think there's truth to that. Um, you know, we've tried to stay um, in, a, in a lane that feels appropriate, um, and it hasn't always been easy. Um, I, I think what I don't agree with is this notion that um, private dollars or philanthropic dollars always have to follow a, a bureaucratic agenda or if there's a, some type of agenda that, or maybe if there's a fiscal shortfall that philanthropy should be there. You know, uh, several years ago, this public-private partnership buzz became really popular and I, I think that those can lead to some good things, but not always. Um, we see ourselves as the ability to be, you know, try new things, bring new ideas to the table. Um, and I, I think that's important not to lose sight of the fact that we have some nimbleness and the freedom to sometimes deliver hard messages, to sometimes try, you know, a, a project that might be uh, too risky to deploy public dollars to. Um, and and that's, that's, it's actually been a, a lot of fun and also a challenge that that we've navigated. So you, you joked about this a couple times earlier, but I've heard you say that deploying resources can be difficult. H how, how hard is it? You want me to go or are you gonna go? Yeah. <laughs> I'm kidding, <laughs> yeah. you go. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a, it's a good problem to have, of yeah. course, and I, so I wanna say that with you know the recognition that I'm in a very fortunate position. For us as a, as a family foundation, 30 years ago, we really became convicted that this idea of trying to make an improvement in education was very important to our, not only our founders, but our the current family members. And, um, you know, if, you, if you're listening to the conversation about where we're struggling in education, I think it, you would be easily convinced that it's a conversation about money. Um, whether we need more facilities, or we need money for technology, or yeah, we need more money for people. Uh, that is largely the conversation that is out there. And so for us, we thought, well, that is what we have. And um, so let's, let's tackle some of these problems. I think not understanding the complex nature of the bureaucracy, not understanding that education is extremely political, um, so money is an ingredient. It is a piece of the equation, of course. But you know, without a vision, without leadership, without the accountability, it doesn't do a damn thing. How do you define courage? 
Well, I think for me it's vulnerability and humility. It's not, not trying to um, be an expert where you're not an expert, not trying to fill a role that you're not uh, capable of filling. And I think admitting that there's room to get better, having honest, hard conversations about where we can improve is, um, is very courageous to me. Okay. So how long do you want to do this? How, how long do you want to stay in your current role? And then maybe what's next? Are you retiring? No. <laughs> okay. Am I? <laughs> <laughs> you came in the other day and told me I needed to work for the next nine years. And I said, I, I don't think I can do that. But. Well, we'll talk about it later over a drink. OK. Um, All right. Uh, well, the so I view, I view my position now as, as wh what's the next generation of philanthropy look like? And th what will the complex problems that um, you know, my kids and the, their kids be, be struggling with? And what's the foundation we're laying for them to be best equipped to want to be contributors? Um, my youngest brother has moved back and is working at the foundation. And lately, I notice that he's energetic and full of ideas and my typical response is well, we've already tried that that doesn't work or that will never work um, or and so there's this level of pessimism that's starting to creep in on the backside of, of 40 that makes me think that um, once you become too pessimistic you can't do this work and so I don't know when that will be um, and then yeah lately I've been super excited about um, you know, being more entrepreneurial in a traditional sense in agriculture. So um, we've been able to start a, a business in hop country and learn about agriculture um, and uh, I think agritourism and some of the things that make the state so fun and unique is that um, opportunity is around every corner and uh, it never ceases to amaze me what you can do here. So um, I'm really excited about that. OK. Yeah. So this, that clock right there says we have eight minutes and 45 seconds left. I don't think this group would be disappointed to let them go get their drinks. <laughs> I saw that food. It looks amazing. It does. Yeah. Do you have any parting words of wisdom mm -hmm. for our, our, our friends here? Oh, that's a lot of pressure for an unscripted question. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I think. I don't, and um, the, the, the reason why, maybe, is because, you know, the older you get, the more you don't know, and um, I truly uh, am a product of that, and I think that's what makes organizations like BVEP so important. In the program I was reading, you know, a, an organization that brings together business people, higher education, uh, you know, the, the power, the collective power of this group is pretty extraordinary. And, um, you know, it'll be great to see uh, with Clark's leadership and, and focus um, how that contributes to keeping this place great. And I'm just grateful for the opportunity to be with you this afternoon. So thank you very much. your dancing music. Okay. I'm not going to fill the seven minutes and eight seconds. Uh, Clark looked at me yesterday and said, I'd like you to do the wrap-up. And I said, well, I think you should do the wrap-up. So we did rock, paper, scissors. And I've never understood how paper beats rock. Uh, so here I am. Uh, it's funnier over there. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Jamie Scott and Roger Quarles. That was terrific. Uh, we're, we're blessed with a huge philanthropic community here, uh, and, and they're obviously one of the leaders. And uh, you, know, you can take a look at the names of the parks along the river, 
and uh, the foundations that take place and the work they do is tremendous, and we're really, really blessed. I also want to thank the presenting sponsors, Wells Fargo and Thornton Oliver Keller. Thank you for that. <laughs> Teresa Foxley from uh, Salt Lake City, thanks for sharing your insight and uh, continued success to you and your region because your success helps us and ours, so thanks for being here, and Clark. So you have some homework. Um, it's a room full of leaders. If you look around the table you're sitting at, uh, you're going to take a look at nine leaders sitting next to you. And uh, Jamie kind of put it on us a little bit. She talked about it takes vision and courage, it takes leaders who are willing to do something courageous, like asking your boss an unscripted question at the end of a session. And growth is one of those challenging topics today, and we don't have necessarily have all the answers, uh, but it is creating some challenges. You talk about homelessness, you talk about housing affordability, you talk about talent pipeline. You want your kids to have opportunities here. You want your grandkids to have opportunities here, right? To get from where we are today to where we'd like to be and keep the great qualities we all enjoy by living here is going to take courageous leadership. And it won't happen by sitting back. If we don't talk about it, we escalate it. So as leaders, don't be silent. Find a topic. Find something you're passionate about and get involved. Jamie said, we need a broader group of people at the table. And leaders are not afraid to solve complex problems. And I think the leadership in this room, she, she represents and that foundation represents strong roots, grow new trees, right? This community has great roots and a very, very bright future, but it takes leaders. So that's your task, that's your homework. You're gonna turn it in when you come back to this event next year. We're gonna ask you what you did to get involved. Uh, but we need everybody here at the table with a voice uh, to help us navigate our way through these challenges. So, on behalf of the Biva Board of Directors and the stakeholders, thanks for your attendance. Uh, there's some wonderful food outside. It might be a cold beer as a result of the hops that are growing in our great region. Uh, thanks to the Biva staff. Appreciate everybody being here. Uh, enjoy the reception. So, we want to give a great big thank you to our presenters, our sponsors, and to you for supporting Boise Valley Economic Partnership. So let's get outside and enjoy each other on the plaza. We'll have live music from Boise Thank Rock you. School. Food is coming to you from Horsewood Catering and some of those drinks from Payette Brewing. And once again, Thank Great you job. to our sponsors. Presenting sponsors, Thornton <laughs> Oliver Keller Commercial Real Estate and yeah. Wells Fargo. Performing arts sponsor, Fidelity History. National Title. Reception sponsors, Title I Corporation, Idaho Central Credit Union, Intermountain Gas Company, Givens Pursley, and Albertsons.